Hi everyone, welcome. This is a special video for Mr. Gardner's Film Studies channel. I am delighted to be joined today by Professor Sean Redman from the Deakin University in Australia. Um, Sean is the author of the fantastic, have it here, Studying Blade Runner. Um, and I've been using it a lot for teaching Blade Runner as well, so, so that's really, really good. Um, and he's very kindly agreed to uh, talk to me today and answer some questions on the film. So, hi, Sean. Hello, good, good to meet you. I'm really pleased to be doing this. Thank you very much. That's really uh, very, very, very kind of you. Um, so, uh, Blade Runner is one of the films that students can choose to study for the new Hollywood option, um, and they have to answer questions on whether or not it's an uh, auteur film or whether it's a film that reflects the context or probably a bit of both uh, as it goes. So I thought we'd just start off with um, talking about Ridley Scott, the director of the film, and the extent to which Blade Runner can be considered an auteur picture. So um, first things first, I know you're a huge fan of Blade Runner, Sean. <laughs> um, are you a big fan of Ridley Scott's work in general? Or is it just Blade Runner? Oh, no, no, I am. Um, I, I, I am, uh, no hesitation. <laughs> Blade Runner is a masterpiece. It's the live and die for, uh, uh, and, and, and that I think is partly because of Scott, but for a whole set of reasons. Uh, but no, I do like his work. I think he's made some remarkable, like Gladiator and Thelma Louise. I won't name them all, uh, but there's a delicate and interesting visual touch in his movies that I find sort of intoxicating, productive, but also quite complex and at times um, disturbing. So, uh, and we'll probably touch upon some of that as we talk, but, but, but Blade Runner, I think, is, you know, it's, it's everything that cinema should be. And is that his masterpiece, you would say, then? It's cinema's masterpiece, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. I, I, it is. Um, I first watched Blade Runner, I'm going to be honest, on a black and white TV. Wow. Uh, at my, uh, you know, at home with my mum and dad. And I can't, it was a late night, really late. After eleven o'clock, um, uh, and on a black and white twenty-four inch cathode ray TV, it literally moved me beyond beyond repair. So, uh, and then obviously I saw it at the cinemas as soon as, as soon as I could after it was you know it'd been re-released, uh, and I followed it ever, ever, uh, ever since. So yeah, even even watching a film like that on a on, on the exact device one shouldn't uh, I find it <laughs> moving. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised actually if they end up doing a re-release in black and white, you know, Blade Runner Noir. It wouldn't uh, surprise me at all. The amount of versions has been of it. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe the, the black and white aesthetics, given it's near noir uh, and a detective film and a whole range of other sort of elusive qualifiers from the past, it worked. Um, could be the definitive yeah, so version. <laughs> it could. That, we should, I might do that now. Just we could easily drain the colour out and see. Yeah. Uh, see what happened. You'd lose some of the some of the signifiers that are important, I guess, uh, which are visually coded, colorfully coded, but otherwise it would still sing, I think, but as it did for me, of course. Excellent. And do you, do you remember if it was the theatrical cut you saw, was there a voiceover in it? Recreational facility. They don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. Ex-cop, ex-blade runner, ex-killer. It was the voiceover. Right, okay. Uh, which I loved. Um, uh, I did because it, obviously it's uh, you know the the, the private detective um, mournful and um, alienated, giving the you know the monotone delivery that that sort of speaks to the film sort of um, I, I guess philosophy. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. So with that in mind, I'm glad you are a fan of Scott's work in general. If I think for for some directors, it's really easy to kind of when you see a, a still frame from a Wes Anderson, or if you watch, you know, five minutes of a Tarantino, you know immediately that's that director and that's a clear sign of an auteur. I think for Scott, it might be a little bit more tricky. I don't think he is one of those instantly recognisable directors. But with that in mind, are there any sort of defining aspects you think of Ridley Scott's, you know, um, directorial signature? I think so. I think you're right. Thank you. In fact, it gets me out of, uh, out of jail in this. <laughs> Unlike Wes Anderson with his framing devices, which are just remarkable. Or even Catherine Bigelow and the way she plays with form, it is a bit more difficult. But I, I picked out three things which are blunt, but nonetheless one could attribute to his work. I think across the is over. So spectacle to cinema of attractions, show and tell, 
gloriously audiovisual filmmaker, um, you know, deep focus, long shots, sometimes little cutting, although that changes depending on what the scene is. Uh, and the worlds that he builds uh, are, are, are imaginable, but at the same time, uh, full of the replete skills of an art form, which is cinema. So cinema attractions is a phrase used, you'll know this by Tom Gunning, he talks about the birth of cinema being this sort of pre-narrational um, device, all and the images themselves tell stories. And I think Scott does that remarkably well. The images in themselves and of themselves and for themselves um, can relay an awful lot about characters, character relations, but also the effective power of space. So number one, I think spectacle. It's a glorious cinema of attractions. Second one is, is tricky. You could say a lot about a lot of directors, uh, maybe even the first one too, of course. But gender ambiguity or complexity, he redraws gender binaries, plays with homosociality and homoeroticism. He, he does, um, but he doesn't always do it successfully. So this, this, this game with gender, with patriarchy, um, with female roles and characters, such as in Thelma Louise, which is arguably a feminist text, um, nonetheless opens up and, uh, and complicates because of the way sometimes he draws his characters. But nonetheless, they're there. Um, obliquely or centrally uh, a concern with, or even if it's subconscious perhaps, uh, with the roles and relationships between heterosexual men and women, but also the tension between how men might desire other men, uh, which might be one of the subsects of Dalliance, for example. Uh, thirdly, uh, I reckon probably genre hybridity. Uh, Alien is a space horror film. Blade Runner is neo noir, steampunk, detective thriller, it speaks to and allusions to German Expressionism uh, and other art forms and its science fiction. So th this melding, mixing, um, um, conjoining between different genres, I think he works in and across quite well too. So I think if you were to argue those three points, spectacle, genre, gender ambiguity, and genre hybridity, you'd find within his work, uh, illustrations, evidence, examples, at least evidence some of those points, I think. Absolutely, yeah, I, I love that as well, and I think the 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 last two, arguably, there's that idea of of transgressing boundaries or or blurring boundaries, isn't there? So either through genre or, or through gender, um, he definitely seems to be interested in in mixing things up, doesn't he? He does, yeah, I I, I think so, and, and as you rightly point to, I think when when they're brought together into the same sort of melting pot, um, that's what makes his films interesting. We move from genre, we move from form. And the characters in these in these um, hybrid creations do things differently, uh, and that's always fascinating mm. uh, for scholars of film. I think absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I think Scott is a director that would be known for working across lots of different genres. You know, um, Gladiator and uh, you know Black Hawk Down and things like that, uh, Matchstick Men. Although I do think primarily, if we were to to Put him into one genre that he is most well known for it would be sci-fi um because of alien because of the martian the alien prequels and obviously blade runner itself what do you think is scott's unique take on the sci-fi genre compared to other directors who work within that genre i, I mean this is a terrible phrase but but pushing the envelope with regards to form and story structure uh alien was a was a really interesting film now it has echoes to things like silent running and uh, other claustrophobic films, perhaps even High Noon, which is a Western, of course. But it's not that that, that um, his work is 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 totally unique, experimental, uh, or expansive in a wider generic sense. But I think um, what he does is is um, you know through the through the, the very notion of genre hybridity, he it's not just repetition, which is one thing that genre filmmaking does, um, but reinvention. Yeah, variation, think, yes. Yeah, which, which is essential to any any any, any good film. So uh, Alien is set in, in space, as you know, where no one can hear you scream. <laughs> uh, a bit binary for high and the low in, in, in Alien between the, the, which we're going to talk about a bit later, between the sort of sterile upper quarters and then the, the sort of weeping uh, lower quarters where the engineers work. He often does that, I think, creates these really interesting um, visual landscapes within his movies. Uh, and that attention to detail is a craft skill. Uh, it's, it is an auteur skill. 
Uh, and that isn't always the case with, with science fiction, which is often a popular uh, mass produced um, um, cinematic form. And so there is, there is the artisan at work in the way he molds and shapes and fashions and builds and sounds uh, the worlds that he creates. They are ideological too, though, which is another question you have for me later. And not all, not all science fiction films are explicitly as political as, as he worked through and upon. Um, and so that struggle with ideology, with hegemony, is something that I think you find in, in, in Scott science fiction films on their surface and not just at the, the, the subtext. So. I see, right, okay. So he brings, he brings the, the subtext to the surface more so than, than other directors. I think so. I mean, that would be the case with Alien and, and, um, and Blade Runner. It's clearly class politics at play in both films. Uh, and arguably, it's not a science fiction argue that works across many of his films. Alienation, outsided, um, uh, a concern with the other. Uh, now, whether it's successful or not is, isn't always clear. Uh, and we can come to some of that a bit later, but but I, th I think that's it. Uh, cinema is a you know is born uh, to be seen to, to to be seen on the big screen, uh, to have the images and and the soundscapes wash over you, uh, and the science fiction films that he creates are so immersive and expressive, and one cannot help being moved by them. And, and again, that, that's the arguably definition of cinema, uh, the way that science fiction works. But but his fingers. Uh, are, are particularly um, um, interesting in that respect, I think. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, at the start, you said um, one of his defined aspects is, is the way he, he treats gender, and you mentioned gender ambiguity. Um, he has been described as a feminist filmmaker. He has had several powerful female lead protagonists in his films. Um, Thelma and Louise, you mentioned, uh, G.I. Jane, and obviously in Ripley in Alien. Blade Runner doesn't have a, a lead female character, it's, you know, Deckard is the lead in that film, but nevertheless you do have some interesting representations of women. How do you think Blade Runner kind of compares to the Ripley's, the G.I. James and the Thelma and Louise's? Oh, such a good question, I think, uh, and it, it's going to be a complex answer, I think. Um, mm, yeah. <laughs> so, or or not, 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 too, not, not, not too extensive, but so we've got three super female characters, Zora, the exotic dancer, Press, the basic pleasure model, and Rachel, the, the femme fatale, the spider woman, arguably. Of course, that's even more complex. Um, yeah. One could see those three characters, though, as, as pastiche, as copies, uh, with a sort of self-reflexive eye that Ridley is, is, is drawing upon. Uh, so again, not, not unconscious, um, but, um, but consciously designed. So the male gaze that op operates in relation to perhaps those three characters, then it would operate in different ways, um, may, may not simply be about to be looked at in us, but about the very operations of steam. Uh, and that would give Ridley a, a get out of jail card in a sense, or the film. <laughs> so uh, not just creating, using women for, uh, for these, these positions or roles, but drawing attention to the very fact that they exist within these um, patriarchal, uh, even if it's set in the future, um, uh, binaries and relationships. Rachel is more problematic. She's framed like a spider woman or a femme fatale. Mm. She can't be seemingly trusted early on. Arguably, lures um, Descartes um, in. Uh, but by film's end, we know, uh, as in many film noir, uh, that there, there is more there is more an ethical center to, to Rachel. She is replicant. Richard Dyer writes that in, in film noir, um, the femme fatales are so brilliantly drawn, so evocatively sexualized, so empowered within the text that they can't be tamed or easily recuperated by patriarchalology. That is when you leave the cinema, you leave remembering the power of the femme fatale and not what happened as the film finished. And I think there's something going on in Blade Runner like that, particularly with Rachel. She's so seductively, carefully, powerfully drawn um, that she can't be just, just done to by Descartes, that there is surplus value in the semiotic sense that resonates for some viewers way beyond the end of the screen time. Uh, Dyer talks about, um, oh God, I forgot the name of the film, with Rita Hayworth. Um, uh, Gilda? Gilda, a brilliant yeah. piece of writing about how 
um, that, that Johnny is just too flaccid a character, that the homoerotic relationships are, 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 are very intimate, so well drawn. But ultimately, Gilda just can't be recuperated. And I think there's something potentially about Rachel in a similar way. So I'm not sure it's a feminist text, but the way it draws its female characters, its replicants, is more complex and interesting, even disturbing than, 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 than a simple, you know, than, than, than their stereotypes, uh, their, their objects of the male gaze. There's some good writing, of course, on Zora being, you know, um, one of the fallen angels. Yeah. Uh, wrapped up in that sort of um, religious um, iconography, which would also complicate a simple, a, a simple reading. So, so that's my answer. Yes, I, I, I think. I, I think the film needs, you know, careful attention to those roles, to the notion of prestige, to surplus value, um, to the to the power that, that that they have at certain points. I should say, though, finally, and it does it, this perturbs me that the violence and the degrees of cursing involved on all three women at different parts in the film is highly problematic. Yeah, uh, and there's some really good writing. My, my friend David German has written on. Uh, you know, the, the, the rape scene in uh, Blade Runner from that perspective, and there's a brilliant reading of it, um, uh, which would counter some of the things I've just, just, just spoken about. Yeah, I, I mean, that scene's one that I really struggle with um, and, and teaching it, especially to, to young people as well. Um, I think with the, the, the fate of Zora and Pris, I think the film encourages you to feel sorrow um, when they die. I think that's quite deliberate. And to not kind of, you know, see this as a real fist pump moment of like, yeah, you know, two replicants dead. Um, but the scene with, with Rachel and Deckard, the, the rape scene, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I find it, it's, it's kind of, it's like, you know, straw dogs, isn't it? It's one of those scenes in cinema where you're really not sure what the intent is behind that scene and how to read that scene. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating moment and really kind of um, interesting, particularly for Ridley Scott as a feminist director to include that moment in the film. It is. I mean, an interesting question would be if if Descartes is replicant, two replicants rape, and so you you, you begin to turn over the philosophical ambiguity of both characters uh, and of their pre-programming. I don't have an answer, and it's again, it's not meant to be detract from the the, the awful misogyny involved in that particular way, especially where it's cut together. Um, and it doesn't play well in the time of Me Too, also. No. Uh, so there are there are waning and withering issues around that uh, uh, around around that scene. Um, that shouldn't be taken too lightly. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a fascinating moment, isn't it? It's definitely something which I think um, you can discuss it from you know multiple angles. But then you know that is Blade Runner, isn't it? It's a film which just can be read in endless different ways. <laughs> Um, okay, so if we, if we move on to, to narrative structure now, and I think um, Ridley Scott, like a lot of auteurs, does structure his films in you know, uh, quite a, a common you know, way that you can see across his movies. Um, very often starting with a uh, violent act right at the very start of the film, and we have that obviously with Blade Runner with Leon uh, shooting Holden. And then the film sort of slows right down. And even before the Leon Holden bit, obviously you've got that Hades landscape in it, it's slow. It's very sort of a slow introduction, isn't it, to the film? Um, and I, you know, I read obviously that Blade Runner was criticised and referred to as Blade Crawler uh, in one review because of the slow pacing of the film. Um, it's something I really love actually about uh, Blade Runner, and, and you know that first part of Alien as well. I think it's just great that sort of slow burn. But I guess my question would be, why do you you think Scott does that in his films? Or probably maybe maybe a slightly easier question to answer would be. What do you think it adds to Blade Runner, that slow, purposeful pacing? Film environments are themselves active narrative agents. That is to say, mise en scène is not only about the way a film is set, but an effective set of relations that help find characters and character relations. Scott Audio visualises his film worlds with such attention to detail and with such evocative imagination because they are story. So if we go back to the beginning of with Tom Gunning's argument about cinema of attractions, he argued, and many of us argue when, when we look at the sort of, sort of history of the moving image, that, 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 that iconography, visuals, images, montage, they are stories. 
So the idea that you need plot, uh, narrative progression, interaction between characters is the only way that story manifests is for many of us not true. Uh, that the replete images found in films such as Blade Runner tell a story in themselves. And it's not just simply that. They're not backdrops. They're not environments just to gaze at. They're active ingredients in the way the film world emotively engages not only with the characters, uh, but the way the viewers, um, viewers watch the film. And when you attend to your locations with such skill, you can use them to employ a whole range of things. In Alien, the pristine white sterile upper quarters are contrasted with the wet and metallic bows of the vessel below, where the blue collar workers go to work. In Blade Runner, the upper layers of the city are clean and ordered, while on the lower levels, acid rain, waste, crime sores. The vistas of BR offer us a terrible beauty, oil fires, neon geisha girls, pyramids and noodle stores, like all of history has been compressed into this one disintegrating city. Visuals are story. And so he spends this enormous amount of time, his craft, his skilling of mise-en-scene because it tells a story. It's an environment that's enmeshed that wraps itself around characters and actions and interactions. Uh, and for me, that's, again, what makes him such an impressive filmmaker and why he might be known to 